It's a true pleasure to be here. Um, I wasn't aware that there was going to be two sessions running at the same time. I, in fact, wanted to go to the other session, but <laughs> I can't. So uh, thank you for being here today. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next uh, 45 minutes is just give you um, a lot of my perspective uh, and a little bit of evidence uh, that might or might not agree with my perspective uh, and hopefully get you to think about autism and the work that we do in autism and especially the research component in autism um, using a developmental approach. Um, not just because autism is defined as a neurodevelopmental disorder, but because kids become youth, youth become young adults, young adults grow and develop, right? So we cannot ignore the developmental perspective and, and dimension uh, in human nature and in autism. So I've been given a machine here. Okay, so tracing autism trajectories can help explain its diversity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm also going to show you three very brief videos, because I know that after a few minutes, you're probably going to get tired listening to my voice. <laughs> Some disclosures to set the stage. If you do get bored and you go on Twitter, these are some of the Twitter handles that we use. The first one is for the McMaster Autism Research Team. The second one is for the pathways in ASD study that I'm going to be describing today. And the last one is my personal, hope, hoping I will get at least five new followers today. <laughs> OK, so I have the privilege of being a parent to two six-year-old twins. Their name is Harris and Katerina, a boy and a girl. And they recently taught me how to use the OK Google function. <laughs> so, so I did that. I said, OK Google, human variation. And this is one of the images that comes up when you say Google, human variation. And is directly relevant to a phrase that we use in the autism community. If you have met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. Before I proceed with the main part of this presentation, I want us to agree on something. And if you don't agree, you go to the next session. <laughs> so one, children with autism have different strengths and challenges. If you agree, please raise your hand. Good. Two, these different strengths and challenges vary across domains, such as social, communication, play, relationships, and over time. If you agree, please raise your hand. OK. And three, our existing models of care do not, actually, our existing models of care should reflect that dynamic variability. Do you agree with that? OK, you can all stay. So now that we agree on these three principles, I will continue to share my perspective and uh, share some empirical evidence from some of our ongoing studies. Uh, and I will start with my perspective. And this is a personal perspective. Some of you might share that, but others might not. That our models of care right now do not reflect that variability. I can blame others. When I was younger, I used to be very good at that. I would blame others, right? Uh, but instead, I am standing in front of you, and I want to take responsibility as a researcher for this issue. I'm then going to discuss how we are making some progress and show you some of the results of our studies, and then share the vision with you, which is the Mac Art vision of advancing autism care through meaningful research. Point number one, our models of care do not reflect variability 
in child strengths and challenges across domains and over time. So this is my kind of high level understanding of our existing models of care. You will see two elements that cut across this figure. The question marks and those little bubbles that say wait or delay. So some of the children that are facing challenges related to autism come to the diagnostic gate. There's variability on the pathway to that gate. Let's just assume they receive a diagnosis. That's the point where they enter the system. And I know that SAC is doing a lot of work to ensure that all of those who should get to that gate in a timely manner uh, actually do that. So they enter the system. Then there's a question mark. And notice that the second question mark is slightly bigger than the first one. There's a question mark in terms of the services they will receive. Uh, depending on assessment and other factors, they might follow pathway to service A, pathway to service B. I'm not going to label what those services are specifically. There's always weight associated with that. At age six or around that age, they enter the school system. The question mark increases in size. And then at some point, they exit the school system. And that's where we get to the very, very large question mark. This is my understanding of our existing systems at a very high level. And we can go into more depth uh, for each of those stages. Now, we know that models of care, and I'm sure that you all agree on this, should be based on evidence. In my personal opinion, the evidence related to autism care compared to other conditions or other topics is rather limited. There's a hierarchy of evidence that you might or might not agree with, uh, but the majority of studies in autism are towards the lower end of this hierarchy of evidence. That is slowly changing, and I will talk about how we can uh, you know, increase um, our, our evidence at the top of this pyramid. So we have a little bit of evidence about specific interventions at specific age groups. But what we don't know is what works, how it actually works, who does it work for? And at which point in time and at which point in development? And if you are a parent or if you're a clinician or if you're a policymaker, this is the kind of information that you would like to have. And this is where I'm going to start sharing some empirical evidence with you, um, specifically from our Pathways in Autism uh, spectrum disorders study, and instead of uh, describing that, we've recently developed a whiteboard video that describes the study. It actually won a top prize in a CIGR national competition uh, on knowledge translation and exchange. So I'm going to share this with you. spectrum disorder or ASD when he was four. Around his second birthday, I had started to wonder why he didn't notice when I called him or look when I pointed out things to him. He wasn't interested in playing with other kids, but he did like to line up his toy trucks a lot. That and spinning their wheels. I was concerned, so Ed and I took him to our pediatrician. That's when we were first told that Ben was on the autism spectrum. We were devastated. 
We really didn't know much about ASD, but soon we were overwhelmed with the amount of information coming at us. I was confused and upset and uncertain. If you have a child with ASD, you know what I'm talking about. We quickly learned that it's very hard to paint a picture of how each child with ASD will grow and develop, or to know what things predict how well they'll do in the future. And that's what we were desperate to know. We would do anything to help Ben live a happy, healthy life. Around the time he was diagnosed, we heard about a new research project underway in several cities in Canada called the Pathways in ASD Study. We'd never taken part in research before, but we wanted to learn as much as we could about ASD. The research team explained that they were going to follow a large group of children with ASD from around the time of their diagnosis until they entered school. We were told that doing the study this way helps to track and better understand how the symptoms of ASD change over time and what things might affect children's development, for better or worse. This is the sort of thing we wanted to know, and taking part in the study might help others too. And I was proud to learn it was parents and other people whose lives are touched by ASD who came up with the idea for the study. The Pathways in ASD study has been set up in phases, with the first following Ben and over 400 other preschoolers from when they were diagnosed until they started school. Phase two then followed the same children, Ben included, from age seven to 11. Every year, the Pathways in ASD team checked Ben's ASD symptoms and his daily living skills and behavior, and asked us how we're doing and our opinions about Ben's condition. Each time, they also asked about his treatment, his school, how we were doing as a family, what kind of services we were getting, and what community programs were available. The Pathways researchers reported what they've learned to us and to other researchers and clinicians. They said it's clear from their work that children all develop differently and that no one should try to predict how a child with ASD will do in the future based on how they've seen a diagnosis. For instance, Children's ASD symptoms and their everyday skills change at different rates. We also learned that treatment should be based on each child's needs and changed as needed as they grow up. I'm happy to say our family just enrolled in phase three of the Pathways in ASD study. We are curious to know what the researchers will find as the kids become teenagers and what sort of things might help them develop and become more independent as they get older. One thing I know for sure, ASD is not a life sentence to one way of being. It is ever-changing. With patience, understanding, and hard work, we can achieve some good outcomes for Ben. I believe the information coming from the Pathways study could help people understand what improves life for those with ASD and for their families. So in a nutshell, this is the Pathways in ASD study. Um, I take part in uh, many different collaborations in Canada and, and across the globe. And I have to say that this study uh, that is led by Dr. Peter Zamari, who also um, happens to be my mentor, is the most pleasant collaboration uh, that I participate in. Now, uh, if we try to look at some of the actual evidence from this study, in 2015, we published a uh, what's called a high-impact paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, Psychiatry, JAMA Psychiatry, and we tried to describe the developmental trajectories of children with autism from the time of diagnosis to age six. So if you plot the autistic symptom severity from time of diagnosis to age six, and you use some fancy, sophisticated statistical analysis, you get two distinct trajectories. The majority of children, 89%, are in a trajectory that is described as severe symptoms 
and stable. Stable also means no change. A small subgroup, approximately 11% of the sample, are in a trajectory that is labeled as less severe and improving. If you then go to plot the adaptive functioning skills during the same period for the same children, you get three distinct trajectories. One of them is labeled lower functioning and worsening, moderate functioning and stable, higher functioning and improving. So no surprises, right? However, if you try to integrate the child's symptoms, autistic symptom severity, and adaptive functioning skills, that's when it becomes more interesting. Um, what we need to know from this slide is that just because your symptoms may be severe and not changing over time, it doesn't mean that your functioning is not improving. And the other way around. Just because your symptom severity is reducing, it doesn't mean your adaptive functioning is improving. So the main message here is that there is little yoking correspondence between a child's trajectory on a given domain, such as autistic symptoms, and another domain, such as adaptive functioning. The big question that remains unanswered is how do services and interventions actually influence the shape of these trajectories, and how do they push children into one or the other trajectory. Uh, at a higher level, this paper and you know, initial work from the pathway study tells us that the idea of high versus low functioning autism is just too simplistic. It does not really capture the variability that we see within the spectrum across children, across domains, and over time. And that takes us back to uh, the first point that all of us in this room agreed on, that children with ASD have different strengths and challenges that vary across domains and over time, and that our models should reflect this dynamic variability. Now, I am pleased to say that you know, instead of just presenting the research findings, I made a conscious decision a few years ago to actually try and do something about it. So uh, for the past two or three years, I'm a member of the uh, ASD expert committee of the Ministry of Children and Youth Services that led to the uh, launching of the new Ontario Autism Program. Now, we're not going to talk about the strengths and challenges of the OAP right now. We can do that during lunch. Um, but I will, I will touch on it a bit as I try to describe how we can use research to make sure that the uh, service delivery systems uh, are the best possible. So I think it is very important as we celebrate our accomplishments as scientists, right? And that's how you celebrate, you know, when you publish in JAMA Psychiatry, you celebrate, right? That's what researchers do. I know it's, it's a bit sad. Um, <laughs> but it is very important to acknowledge our limitations. So there's been some progress by our group and some other groups in the States and in Europe uh, to explore autism over time. Uh, but what we really do is we use trajectory lines to connect A to B to C. So in research, much of the time, we are obsessed with reducing variability. We use a lot of data reduction techniques, including this trajectory analysis, uh, just so that we can understand uh, the data. And of course, in this case, I showed you two or three distinct mutually exclusive, ex exclusive trajectories, and we know that that's not how kids develop, right? So going back to the idea of human variation uh, in autism. So the first figure is the first figure that I shared with you uh, in terms of the autistic symptom severity. And remember we said there's two distinct trajectories. Now, when you have a sample of 420 children with autism and you try to characterize them using two 
lines, two distinct lines. That's not very informative. At the time, we thought it was informative because no one had ever done it before. But now we know that it's just a step. Uh, we need to do better in describing that variability uh, within the spectrum. So I went back, you know, so Fridays I usually teach. Um, if there's a reading week break or something, I get a little bit bored, so I go back to my old data, right? So I went back to the same published data and just plotted the autistic severity symptom scores for the same kids for the same period in a different way. I said, instead of trying to identify trajectories, why don't we plot the change in scores over time? So all we need to know from this graph is that if you score above this line, this green line that's, that aligns with zero, if you score above this line, that means your autistic symptom severity got worse from diagnosis to school entry. If you score below this line, that means your autistic symptom severity got better. And the bigger the bubble, the more children score at that level. So take a look at these graphs and tell me if the second one is more informative in terms of explaining variability than the first one. Please raise your hand. Thank you. So this made me you know, wonder, wonder about the way we analyze our data, the way we report our data. And um, in 2013, I, I wrote uh, a, with Peter Zamari and some other colleagues an editorial um, challenging the research community to rethink heterogeneity instead of an obstacle that we try to kind of eliminate post hoc Think of it as informative variants. That's how clinicians think about it, right? So uh, this is an effort for researchers to get closer to the way clinicians uh, and professionals in the field think. Uh, and that's one of my favorite quotes. Why fit in when you were born to stand out? I actually have it uh, on the wall in my office. In science, there's a lot of talk lately about using big data. Everyone is talking about using big data. Now, in the clinic, right, including in the new OAP, uh, there's a lot of talk about individualized care. So the question is, how do you go from big data to individualized care? If you know what big data is, it's just overwhelming, right? How can you use big data to inform care at the individual child level. And that's the challenge that I'm um, trying to, uh, to address over the next few years. So uh, my dad, uh, when I was growing up, would always say to me, uh, try and hang out with kids who are better than you. <laughs> uh, my basketball coach used to say to me, try and practice with players who are better than you. And Peter Zapmari, uh, my mentor um, and good friend, uh, continues to this day to tell me, if you want to have an impact, work with people who are smarter than you. So that's what I do. That's my, that's my life, and, and Esther here uh, knows exactly what I mean. So uh, there's a couple of colleagues in the US, Summer Bishop and Thomas Frazier. Summer Bishop is uh, at the uh, University of California in San Francisco. Thomas Bishop um, was at the Cleveland Clinic, is now the scientific chief of Autism Speaks International. Um, so the three of us would go to these conferences and we would go to these presentations and we were all frustrated with the simplistic way that variability in autism is being presented by scientists. So we sat down and started writing an editorial perspective and we came up with a new term. We actually Googled the term just to make sure that no one else has used it before. Uh, and the term is chronogeneity. I had to somehow embed that Greek piece in there, right? <laughs> so chrono means time. So chronogeneity simply means heterogeneity over time. And again, instead of me trying to explain what that is, I'm going to show you um, a recent video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
child with autism, you have seen one child with autism. How many of you are familiar with this race? Raise your hand. Almost everyone. That is a phrase we use to describe heterogeneity or diversity in autism. Now take a look at this phrase. This is a phrase by a mother of a child participating in one of our research studies. When my three-year-old son was diagnosed with autism, I never thought he would one day play for his school basketball team. So in my opinion, that is a phrase that speaks to the diversity of outcomes in children and youth and individuals with autism. It really got me thinking. It reminded me how little we know about a child's trajectory at that initial point of diagnosis. As a researcher, I have been studying autism heterogeneity for years. But my work, as, work as, as well as the work of my colleagues, at least most of my colleagues, was based on a rather static view of autism. We would ask questions like, how are kids similar or different at the point of diagnosis? Or how are kids similar or different before and after a specific treatment? But we know that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. I personally think we're doing a good job for the neuro part in terms of research. And I encourage everyone to think more about the developmental part. Development is complex and it's dynamic. And it never follows a straight line. So as researchers, it is those complexities that we need to embed in our work and make sure that we have a way of capturing the diversity as children and youth grow and develop. So my colleagues and I recently introduced the concept of chronogeneity, which is the study of heterogeneity in relation to the dimension of time. Everyone is talking about the need for a continuum of care, systems of care that are continuous, as seamless as possible, and adaptive to the changing needs of individuals with autism and their families. For researchers to be able to inform the development and the evaluation of these types of systems of care, we need to embed the chronogeneity into our work. That's going to require large collaborations, and it's going to require a different way of thinking about analyzing our data and drawing conclusions from our data. So my message today to you is to take out your autism lexicon, go to the innovations chapter, and add the term chronogeneity, the study of heterogeneity <coughs> in relation to the dimension of time. I will also ask you to delete two other terms from that lexicon. We need the word ego, whether it's the ego of a superstar scientist, whether it's the ego of an institution or an organization. To have true collaborations, we need to delete the word ego, and also delete the word partisan politics. <laughs> There's nothing innovative about politics and egos when you're trying to improve the way you do research that can then help individuals and families affected by autism. This is Canada, and we can do better. Thank you for your time. Okay, so I think you get the message. Chronogeneity is heterogeneity over time. This figure shows how your data or your trajectories could look like for a large group, a population, uh, for a given subgroup of of individuals, or for the individual child, youth, or adult. And the idea is that as we continue to study how groups and subgroups do over time, it is very important, especially for informing clinical care, to understand how the individual child is developing in relation to its own trajectory, in relation 
to the trajectories of his or her peers. So uh, we are very interested in embedding this, this concept both uh, in our research studies but also in our clinical care at the McMaster Children's Hospital. Uh, and we're interested in identifying key moments in treatment efficacy when a child might shift trajectories. What's happening at the services level, at the family level, at the community level, at the school level that might push one child to one trajectory or the other? Uh, and then we're also interested in searching for important mediators of treatment effectiveness. And culture, as it was discussed earlier today, uh, might be a very important one. So this is my favorite figure. This is a figure that you can find in the ASD expert um, committee recommendations to the Ontario government uh, about the new autism program. It shows a service system that is continuous, that is smooth, and that goes from H0, basically, all the way up to 21. This is related to the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. The ministry, in, in its announcements, um, says that the new OAP will provide more flexible services at a level of intensity that meets each child's individual needs. And my question to the ministry, to my colleagues in the expert committee, and to you is based on what evidence? Do we have the evidence we need to implement a continuum of care that is individualized for each child? My opinion, as I've said earlier, is that we don't yet. So moving forward, the concept of chronogeneity can be useful when we're designing the new studies uh, in autism. However, it is time for scientists to stop working in silos. Small studies can be useful, but they're not enough. We need strategic partnerships, and we need strategic funding. When you have funding agencies supporting small studies, individual investigators or teams, then no one is thinking about the bigger picture. And in terms of evidence, it is that big picture evidence for a continuum of care that we're missing right now. Uh, we need collaborative and interdisciplinary teams. The theme of this conference today is built on collaboration. We need comprehensive and sensitive measures. Many times we use diagnostic measures that were designed to assign children into yes or no boxes. We use them in longitudinal and follow-up studies. How useful is that? So we are working with uh, our colleagues in, in the States uh, on building new measures that are sensitive to change as kids uh, grow and develop. And we recently got an NIH grant to study that. We're very pleased about that. And we need better and bigger data, methods, and science. The new term now, there's an editorial um, that talks about not just big data, but big science. Big data usually happens after the studies are completed. People start to merge their data sets, and then they try to answer some questions. Big science talks about that collaborative piece across research teams up front before anything begins. So that's exactly what we're trying to do at McMaster. Uh, we formed something called the McMaster Autism Research Team a couple of years ago, and our vision is embedded in our logo so that nobody forgets it. The vision is to advance autism care through meaningful research. It is a partnership between the university and the hospitals in Hamilton, aims to reduce the research to practice gap and to advance autism care through meaningful research. As I've said, uh, we've been working in silos. Now, since the theme is culture, uh, you know, we talk about uh, language, ethnicity, race being factors contributing to culture, right? Well, where I come from, there's a different culture in researchers. There's a different culture in clinicians. There's a different culture in policymakers, and I will not comment about the culture in politicians. 
There's a different culture in basic science versus clinical or applied science. So how can you integrate all of these uh, elements? How can we do better by using interdisciplinary approaches, uh, more meaningful research? Someone asked me, are you claiming that some of the research we're doing is not meaningful? And I said, yes. <laughs> and how can we have a bigger and quicker impact on clinical practice and policy at the regional level, at the provincial level, and at the federal level? So MACART has over 40 uh, members, experts, scientists, and clinicians uh, in Hamilton from across 12 academic departments and five research centers. Our scientists and clinicians uh, have expertise and interest uh, in biomedical, clinical, social determinants, and health systems um, topics. And they're all uh, working together in autism research. Um, but MACART has four components that contribute to autism care. The research piece, as I said, there's a big and strong training component we think that if you want to shift paradigms, it's best to invest in your young trainees. The community element, the community collaboration is, is fundamental to what we do. And we are actively involved at all levels of government in informing and shaping policy. The strategic priorities, we want to bring people together. At McMaster, we love bringing people together. Um, we've had a couple of symposia, and I will talk about them. Uh, we are offering new and innovative training and learning opportunities. Uh, we're developing and implementing uh, meaningful and innovative studies. Uh, and we want to facilitate that timely translation from research into practice and policy. Two years ago, we had our first symposium. Uh, we brought stakeholders together. Uh, we asked them to identify the, their priorities when it comes to early intervention. Connie Kasari from UCLA, some of you uh, are familiar with her work, was our keynote speaker. Uh, the focus was on early intervention. These are the three top priorities by the stakeholders themselves. Shift the system's emphasis from diagnosis to function. Achieve pragmatic balance between standardized approaches and individualized needs and plans and focus on the whole family. Don't just focus on the child. And I don't have to say that, because uh, the people in this room all understand that. We had our second symposium in September 2017. We had 250 attendees from across different stakeholders. The focus this time was on rethinking autism training. The three top priorities, you're getting a sneak preview of the three priorities we just finalized um, data analysis is embedding stakeholder collaboration into training programs. Many times, all of us are asked to participate in stakeholder collaborations, but we've never received training on how to do that. So we do our best, right? Uh, but we can do better if we have appropriate training. Uh, we need to build the infrastructure and capacity for this interdisciplinary training. Again, as clinicians, as scientists, as professionals, you are asked to be part of interdisciplinary teams, but we're not trained that way. And then don't eliminate diversity. Try to use the diversity in personal experiences in the training models. We all come from different backgrounds. We all share the same vision. But don't eliminate that diversity. Use it in your training models. This is a picture from the symposium on training. Uh, that's Caroline Ronkading. It's the clinical director of the autism clinic at the Children's Hospital. Uh, it was a fantastic day, uh, and I'm going to share a video with you at the end. So what we're doing now is we're taking everything we've learned through the pathway study, through other collaborations, through stakeholder input, and we're putting it all in what we call the Pediatric Autism Research Collaborative. This is a pilot study that we've recently launched at the McMaster Children's Hospital. And what we're doing is we are embedding a meaningful research protocol within our clinic. Our clinic serves over 2,000 children and youth with autism. We want every single one of those 
individuals and families to somehow be involved in our research. And we want to use research to inform clinical practice in real time. And we want to do that within the new OAP and hopefully gather some information that would be of use to the government and the experts as they are adapting and refining the OAP. Uh, this is the high level structure of the PARC pilot study. Um, we basically want to use data collection and analysis to inform clinical care in real time as it happens. Usually research studies, by the time they're done, they're old news for clinicians and families. So we want to embed this research process within the clinic and work with the clinicians uh, and use technology. We've developed an online data hub that allows us to analyze the data as we go and develop customized reports for the clinicians, the families, the educators as children grow and develop. Uh, the PARC project has three platforms, the biomedical uh, that's done in collaboration with many other institutions in the province. Uh, there's a clinical uh, platform and of course the socio-contextual platform. We feel that most clinical research studies lack that socio-contextual, the social determinants of health that includes culture and is so crucial. And we think that dynamic approach that systematically examines heterogeneity over time or chronogeneity at the group, subgroup, and individual level will help us understand the underlying factors and mechanisms for autism, uh, but perhaps most importantly, will inform more adaptive diagnostic and intervention services for children and families living with autism. Now, in the States, there's a movement called the Learning Healthcare System that is basically what I just described, is using patient and uh, research participant data to inform their clinical care on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and Charles Friedman from the University of Michigan, who is the brains behind this movement, uh, will be visiting McMaster uh, to help us think about the next steps uh, sometime uh, this April. And this figure basically describes what a learning healthcare system is, where the internal system and the external community system interact, where health in a learning healthcare system, research influences practice, and practice influences research. So it's a bi-directional uh, system. And I'm going to end with uh, the video from uh, again, this is a, a sneak preview, uh, the video from our uh, Autism Symposium on Research Training. So I'm always so energized when I come to this McArt Symposium. It really is such an amazing opportunity to see clinicians, junior researchers, senior researchers, families, autistic adults, all in one room talking about what we know is critically important, which is autism training. To see so many people come to a point where we're, we were over capacity and everybody to be on the same page and to see that sort of like intellectual progress happening right here on the ground floor was pretty interesting. There's a lot of you know, super bright and accomplished people here and people representing the advocacy community and policy makers and got all the right partners at the table to be talking about training and brainstorming about how we can work together more effectively. It is important to raise not only awareness about autism but understanding. Expanding on that, I think that training in autism is actually training people for a better society in general. I think for us uh, as government, uh, it's really important to be at the table to get that multidisciplinary perspective. So we get to hear from advocates, from parents, from researchers, clinicians, and that really helps influence our work. It's wonderful that so many people from so many different sources are passionate about training and are willing to support it. So I think it's one of those pieces that can easily um, get forgotten or put on a back burner in the interest of what seem to be other higher priorities. What is so striking is uh, the 
kind of diversity of the audience uh, and, the, and the presenters. It really is a symposium that is bringing together the academic world, the clinical world, children and families. It's really a model for how a lot of things should be done and it doesn't often happen this way. We're actually here today training each other and learning from each other and that's a really amazing opportunity for us to grow and share and learn um, and really collectively leave here and be able to do what we do better uh, to serve our community. The only way you learn is by exchanging ideas and information. So that to me is absolutely essential in reaching out to everybody. Whether they're professionals, whether they're parents, whether they're like me who are on the spectrum, and we all collaborate together with our unique experiences. It's important to remember these things happen on a daily basis in different ways in different places. And uh, for us all to see that in one place at a time, it's, it's really great. You know, training people up, making people more aware, it, I think will really help to allow, you know, everybody in our society to get to where they, where they should be, where they can be. So, when we talk about next steps, it really is relationships between people and moving our agendas forward so that we can improve opportunities for people on the autism spectrum. As the chair of CASDA, you know, my hope is that we would see symposiums like McGart uh, happening right across the country. We're not just in a, a place of awareness anymore, we're in a place of understanding. We're going to go into that now. And especially we're having more autistic people who are going into the professional sphere and I think we are going to change that from the inside out as well. So I'm going to end right there. Uh, I want to thank the children and families who um, have been part of our studies, who serve as our consultants and as our partners in this journey. Uh, my collaborators in Canada and the US, the amazing research team and colleagues, some of which are in this room today, all of our sponsors. Um, I've listed four potentially useful websites for you to explore. Uh, there's also a document in the, in the app that describes kind of the program of research um, at McMaster. Uh, and, and, and I want to end by inviting you to think about MacArt as a potential resource or as a potential partner and collaborator in what you do. So just because this is happening at McMaster, it does not mean that it's territorial. Um, we want to build a foundation, uh, a template, a blueprint that can be used across the province and across the country. And in fact, we're working with many, many um, partners across Canada uh, to use some of this infrastructure, some of this capacity that we've developed at McMaster uh, towards the common vision, which is to enhance the quality of life uh, for individuals and families um, uh, impacted in some way by autism. Uh, and I'm going to stop right there and hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. Thank you.